All right, this video is all about how to lie with statistics, and we're looking at when the math is actually misleading. So let's go ahead and look at our first example, and in this one, we're talking about when there is an axis that is too zoomed in. So this is probably the most common uh, way that people use misleading graphs and charts is when there's an axis too zoomed in. So look at this chart right here. We're looking at interest rates from 2008 to 2012. And this is actually one where the Y axis is too zoomed in. If you look at that Y axis over here, if you notice it's only going up by 0.002%. So it's a super zoomed in Y axis. And it makes it look, the graph looks like it's increasing a ton, but really from 2008 to 2012, the interest rates only increased 0.012%. So now we're gonna look right here next to it, we're gonna at the same exact graph, but with a zoomed out Y axis. So now you can see that Y axis is going up by 0.5% instead of 0.002%. And so, Notice how much smaller it, the increase looks, but it is the exact same 0.012% increase. Uh, this one is a lot more realistic interpretation of that increase. And again, look, notice the difference because it's the exact same information. In the zoomed in version on the left, it appears to be an exponential increase from 2008 to 2012. But then on our one on the right, we can see that it clearly is definitely not an exponential increase. It's actually a very, very small increase. Let's take a look at our next example. And that's when we don't start at the bottom of an axis. So this is actually a very common tactic as well when you're trying to kind of manipulate data. So let's look at this example right here. And if you read that top headline, it says Times continues to crush the Daily Telegraph in print and online sales. So if you look at the graph, it's going to say we're looking at full price sales. Our Y axis on the left is copies sold in thousands. So it's graphing total copies. And then if we look at our comparison here, we got the Times right there in blue, Daily Telegraph right there in pink. And if we just look at this, the eye test is telling us that the Times is absolutely crushing the Daily Telegraph in copies sold. Looks like it's more than doubled up in sales. But if we look at where it is starting, it starts at 400,000 copies sold right there. So instead of starting at zero, it started all the way at 400,000. So it makes the that distance seem much larger than it really is. So let's zoom out the y-axis and start actually at zero. So we're starting at the actual bottom where we should start and it gives us a much more realistic look at the comparison of the times and the daily telegraph. And you see right here our y-axis at the bottom is starting at zero and you can see the comparison of the times and daily telegraph is a lot closer that gap a lot less than doubled up so this graph right here gives us a lot more realistic picture of what's going on third way to manipulate graphs charts data is by taking a biased sample so this one's a pretty quick and easy one to understand so that's just if you're taking a survey of some kind and you just have a biased sample group. So this cartoon right here gives us a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about with that. So if you look at the lady in green on the right, she's taking some sort of survey and then read the bubble. It says, do you prefer cats or dogs? So the survey is a survey of do you prefer cats or dogs? However, when taking good surveys, getting good survey data, you want the samples to be completely random and unbiased. This person is asking a lady walking a dog right there if she prefers cats or dogs. So clearly that would not be a good case to use in your survey data. You want this to be blind and completely unbiased. So that is an example of a biased sample, especially if She's interviewing everybody like that who's walking dogs. So that's a bias sample. 
another way that the data can be manipulated is with a small sample. So sometimes a sample is just too small to make any significant conclusion about anything. So let's take a look at an example of that. So here is a pie chart and if you read the headline it says who do you plan on voting for in the current mayoral election and if you look at the graph right there it says 50% of people say they will be voting for Smith, 25% voting for Collins, and 25% voting for Anderson in this mayoral election. So based on this chart you would say well probably Smith is the clear favorite 50% favor Smith in this survey. However, if you look at the top right below the headline, it says who was interviewed in this survey, and it's a survey of just 10 people in New York. So it's clearly for a New, New York mayoral election. And so 10 people is really just not enough people to ha have any good sense how things will go because if you know what New York's population is, New York City, it has almost 19 million people that live in New York City. So basing your survey and saying, oh, Smith is clearly the favorite because of 10 people. Well, that's such a small percentage of the New York population that really you would need a lot more data to make any sort of inference off that. Another way data can be manipulated is correlation versus causation. So things can correlate, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily related in any way. So what I want you to come across with this is just because two things correlate does not mean that there is a direct effect between either of them. And sometimes there is a direct effect, but that's what you have to decide for yourself when looking at correlation versus causation. And this video is about misleading, so we're going to look at examples that are misleading. So let's look at ice cream sales, which we'll track in blue, and the frequency or the amount of ice cream sales is going to be tracked on the left. So let's look at what ice cream sales look like over a course of a year. And there's a big spike from June to October. And let's also graph shark attacks frequency as well. And so you can see the two lines pretty much map one another. But that does not mean that shark attacks have any direct effect on ice cream sales or vice versa. Yes, they do both have a big spike in the summer. Uh, both have an increase in summer. But that does not mean either has a direct effect on the other. Common sense just tells you. It's probably because the weather is hotter, people are swimming at the beach more for shark attacks, and it's also hotter so people are going to buy more ice cream. But that doesn't mean that people buying ice cream is going to lead to more shark attacks. Let's take a look at another example of this. And so we're going to graph two things that are correlated the same way but have absolutely no direct effect on one another. So first, we're going to graph in red per capita cheese consumption. And notice we actually have two different axes here. So cheese consumption is going to be graphed on the left in terms of pounds right there. So that's where the cheese consumption numbers are. And we're going to graph that over time in red. So right there, cheese consumption per capita is going up over time from 30 pounds, a little bit below 30, to 2009, it's now near 34, so people are eating more cheese. Second thing we're going to graph, which is completely unrelated, is the number of people who died by getting tangled in their bed sheets. And again, these are different y axes, so the bed sheet deaths is going to be tracked on the right side of the graph, right there. So let's look at how that increased or decreased from 2000 to 2009. And there is the number of people who died getting tangled by their bed sheets. Very, very much mirrors the per capita cheese consumption. However, again, common sense will tell you cheese consumption has probably very little direct effect on the number of people who died getting tangled in their bed sheets. Maybe there was one person who ate too much cheese, passed out, and got tangled in their bed sheets, but probably is very unrelated to things.
And finally, the last thing we're going to look at is a misleading timeline. So when looking at misleading timelines, you just want to make sure that timeline is not cherry picked, that the, whoever's doing the data didn't just zoom in on a very specific window of time to not give you a full idea of the whole picture. So let's take a look at an example of that. So let's we're graphing shoe sales of some company here. We got total sales graphed over there on the left. And we're taking this from March of 2017 to June of 2017. So shoe sales of this company from March to June of 2017. And let's say it looks like that. So it looks like March of 2017 to June of 2017, the shoe sales are going up. So the shoe company is doing pretty well, you would think from this. But let's zoom out and get a, a larger picture of this company's shoe sales. And we want to do this by year, actually, not just four months right here. And we'll get a better idea of how the company's shoe sales are going. So now our x-axis at the bottom has changed. It's a lot much larger window of data. And now let's track the shoe sales. So from 2013 to 2018, actually, the company's shoe sales are decreasing a lot. But what that graph before showed you was just this little window right there where it seems to be increasing from March to June of 2017. And the previous graphs data is cherry picked from just that four month period of positive sales. So always be aware about timeline. And if somebody is just showing you one time when it, things were good, you want to get the whole picture. So a final note on everything we went over in this video is that when looking at any graph from any source, always double and triple check to make sure you aren't being fooled. Have a nice day.